We're rolling. Welcome to the REI Rookies Podcast. The Real Estate Investing Rookies Podcast, episode number seven, where we invite you to follow us on our journey towards financial freedom using the power of real estate. I'm Josh Koth. And I'm Jack Haas. All right, everybody. Well, the purpose of this podcast is uh, to really allow us to talk about the subject matter, real estate investing. And uh, honestly, repeating it a lot really helps it stick in our feeble rookie brains. So we believe a rising tide lifts all boats. We're not competitors. We're a community. So let's uh, invest in some real estate together and build up that passive income. Tonight, we uh, talk about uh, part four of our exit strategies, and we'll focus on buy and hold. That's correct. When you're looking at property and considering what to do with it, um, you have to kind of know the end. The, you, have to, you have to start with the end in mind, right? So what are your, and those are called your exit strategies. How are you going to profit and actually, you know, take your profits from this property? And uh, just to recap, those were wholesaling was the first one, quick flip the second one, fix and flip or rehab, and buy and hold is the fourth. So that's the one we're going to talk about this week. So first of all, what is a buy and hold property? Well, a buy and hold property is one that you purchase at a discount and make sure that it cash flows, um, cash and provides a cash on cash return. Exactly. So <clears throat> this is such an important strategy. Um, really, this is kind of where every, in my mind, this is where every dollar should ultimately end up is in the buy and hold strategy. Whether you, you use other strategies to generate cash, um, this is where those dollars should ultimately end up. So that's kind of what we do is we use all the other exit strategies to ultimately fund the buy and hold strategy. And that's because it's so powerful. This generates that the uh, all important passive income that everyone's looking for that allow you to escape the rat race as Richard or as Robert Kiyosaki says in rich dad, poor dad, um, <clears throat> you know, it gives you that financial freedom everyone's looking for and, and buy and hold real estate is the vehicle that can do that. Right, Jack? That's right. And one of the things that we really focus on is not only that financial freedom, but freedom of the property. We like the idea of buying the property and owning the property, but we don't really go as far as managing that property, right, Josh? Yeah. One of the things you want to, uh, when you're figuring out your formulas, and we'll kind of go through a, a quick formula of how we calculate whether something is a good investment or not, but one of the, uh, the costs, the expenses you have when you're buying and holding a property is that of management, property management. And this is where a lot of newer investors think they can save some money. They think, well, I'll just manage it myself and save that 7 to 10%, depending on your area. Up here in the Fargo area, it's between you know seven and eight percent, and some other areas of the country it can be as high as ten percent cost of property management, and that's you know ten percent of the rents collected, um, along with some fees for finding um, tenants and doing leases and showings and things like that. Um, <clears throat> you know that's an attractive place to possibly uh, save some money, right, by doing it yourself, but. What you'll quickly quickly realize is that's not a cost effective strategy because if you have one property, that may be possible. But as soon as you get into the four, five, six, ten, fifteen, twenty properties, uh, managing those basically it becomes a full time job, and that's something that's really difficult to maintain the pace of, and you can't really scale beyond those numbers. And if you want to achieve true financial freedom, you need to have you know, quite a few properties in your portfolio. And if you're managing those all the time, you're not truly free. You just have a pretty well-paying job. Um, and that's really not what we're in this for. We're in this to escape the, uh, you know, the clutches of having to be somewhere at a certain time, punch the clock, you know, and if you're managing properties, well, you're on call basically 24-7, right? That's right. And when you do calculate those numbers and make sure we always take into account that property management because uh, you self-managing it you might get one number but with the management you might get another and you're going to be far more conservative if you uh, factor that in now and get used to that calculation now yep and so we figure all 
potential properties that we're looking at. We're entertaining buying them or making an offer. We run our formulas with property management figured in, even if even if we were going to manage it ourselves, because eventually you're going to want to pass that job onto someone else. So you have to have you know that expense figured into your calculations. So that's one very important point, always factor in the cost of property management. Also, honestly, it's not a job I want to do. Um, <clears throat> you know, and if you talk to a lot of property managers, they typically, it's not a very fun uh, job. You're dealing with, you know, tenants, uh, doing a lot of showings. People have lots of complaints. You know, you're the sounding board for all these tenant complaints. Um, it's not a very... Uh, attractive job to me either. So even if I could save some money by doing it myself, it's not something I really want to do. So there's lots of reasons to pass that on to someone else. And someone who's also better trained at doing it, Do you, are you going to want to run credit checks, criminal background checks, take applications, call references, do all these other things you have to do to qualify tenants to see you know, if they're able to rent your properties, um, <clears throat> are you going to be able to do that as well as someone who's properly trained? Um, you might be able to learn it, but is that the best and highest use of your time? Uh, doubtful, right? Yeah, I strongly agree with that. And, you know, uh, some of the naysayers when it comes to real estate investing, that's one of the first things that I hear is, uh, you really going to take those phone calls at 2 a.m. for a <laughs> clogged toilet? Um no, yeah. uh, no, I'm not. Exactly. I'm going to find somebody who has, that's their job, and that's what they have based their business on and has that expertise. Mm -hmm. And if done well, mm -hmm. property management can be a lucrative business if someone owns that. So I prefer to just trust experts to do what they do best and do that for us. And I get that response quite often as well. You know, people say, well, I just don't want to deal with a clog toilet at two in the morning and i say just like you do neither do i i and i my line is i always say i want to be an owner i want to be an investor not a landlord because you know there's kind of a, a stigma attached to being a landlord a negative connotation to being a landlord and some of that is is well earned by you know not that great of landlords um <clears throat> and some of it is just a you know unrealistic expectations by tenants as well and there's kind of a innate adversarial relationship between landlords or property management and tenants and that's something i really don't want to be a part of so i you know steer clear of that and uh, i'm an investor i'm an owner try not to be a landlord avoid that at all costs right yeah that's right and when finding that buy and hold property we're pretty much following the same rules and guidelines we've chatted about previously on, you have to find that property in the um, cosmetically bad situation, mm -hmm. but foundationally good. You know, we want uh, we got we want good bones, if you will, but exactly. that we can do provide quick updates and uh, something that we can uh, uh, set up that is a quick turnaround. We don't want to have to rehab this for six months to a year. Yep, exactly. And like all other strategies, and here comes that mantra again, it really depends on getting it cheap. And buying and holding is no different. Um, and the only difference being when we run our calculations, rather than running them off what the ARV <clears throat> or the after repair value or what similar comps have sold for, we just start with what is it rent for? What is it, what is the cap what is it capable of being rented for? And that's our number because that's really all we care about. What are you going to, that's because that's that cash flow is, is what is going to provide your uh, profits. So, <clears throat> you know, a lot of people uh, mistakenly invest for appreciation, and that's not something that we do. We focus on cash flow, and appreciation, if it comes, is just kind of the icing on the cake. We're not investing counting on that because if you're counting on that uh you might be disappointed and it's also you know one of the slower ways to accumulate wealth so we prefer to invest for cash flow so as a result of that our calculations are based on what will the property rent for so like i mentioned in a previous podcast i was talking to a seller and he was telling me what he thought the property was worth and going into all you know kinds of detail about that, and I stopped him and I said, "Well, what does it rent for?" 
And he said, $1,000. <clears> so I just ran my quick formula of taking 40% off the top for expenses, leaving 60% or $600, which would be left over to give us our cash flow and pay any debt service we have on the property. Uh, and you say, well, great, that's $600 a month in cash flow. That's awesome. Well, unless you're you know, buying the property with all cash, which is one possibility and we've done in the past several times, um, all we care about is what is the return? What's our return on investment, our cash on cash return on investment we're going to generate uh, with that money? So, <clears throat> and basically, we have a formula where we can determine what a mortgage payment will approximately be based on a purchase price, and we back into that. So, on this example property um, that was renting for a thousand dollars, he wanted a hundred and sixty thousand for it, and based on my calculations, which were take off forty percent, you're left with sixty percent, six hundred dollars. We try to make eighteen percent of the rent as our typical net profit, our cash flow. That left four hundred and twenty dollars to service the debt on the property and in current market conditions current borrowing conditions that we backed into a purchase price based on uh, the more typical mortgage payments uh, of 96,000 so as you can see where we're quite far off but if we had purchased it for that price that property would have cash flowed so that's uh, that's what you have to do because if we paid any more than $96,000 for this property that rents for a thousand dollars a month we would be either breaking even or losing money, and that's not a place you want to be, right? Yeah, that's right. And another calculation that you might hear quite a bit is that one percent rule. You'll want one uh, percent for of the value of the property uh, as your as your rental, and that's kind of a that's that's kind of a vague target, mm -hmm. but a lot of depending on your market, it might be accurate. Uh, it's a good rule of thumb when you're sifting through a bunch of listings. <clears throat> you know, either off-market properties or on the MLS, and you're looking at data, and you see they want $150,000 they're asking. Well, if you can get a hold of what it rents for or what a similar property would rent for, if it's not $1,500 you know, a month, you know you're going to be offering a lot less because that property will not cash flow uh, unless you typically get it for a lot less than that. So, <clears throat> And we found that bears out to be very true. Um, and all our properties that we hold, um, that 1% rule is in effect. And the, the ones that are performing the best have the highest, uh, you know, ratio of rent to purchase price. You know, we have some that we purchased in the, you know, forty fifty thousand dollars $50,000 range that rent for six, seven, eight hundred dollars $800. That's a good ratio. That's going to cash flow for you. Um, <clears throat> some of the ones that are closer to right to the 1% or just slightly under, they're not as profitable and you know that formula you know pretty much proves to be true most times so one of the things that we uh, gonna need to talk about regarding the buy and hold is how we're going to rehab it and we do rehab it differently than if it was a fix and flip uh, fix and flip we may take into account being a little bit more stylized putting in a few extra features to attract a buyer like stainless steel appliance is a great example. For but for buy and hold, we're looking to make it renter ready. Yeah, um, which means durable, clean, functional. That's kind of our <clears throat> mantra. You know, they walk in, they say, "Okay, I could live here," um, but it's not going to be the home of their dreams, right? It's not new stainless appliances like you mentioned. If we have a working fridge and a working stove, uh, it, in the types of you know levels of properties that we're talking about. That's all you need. And to buy new stainless appliances would just be a waste of money because they're going to be consumed by your renters, by your tenants anyways. So you want to maximize the life of every appliance or everything in the house. Um, you know, So we learned some techniques. Like, for instance, when you're doing a bathroom remodel, you're just looking for what's the most durable material, not what is you know the most attractive or what's going to yield a higher purchase price. You just want something durable so it can endure, you know, taking a beating from tenants coming in and out year over year. Um, less less things you have to replace, the better, right? And that's one, you know, like where flooring comes into play. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times we'll just do linoleum. You know, it's tough. It's cheaper, you know, in a kitchen or, you know, depending on the types of carpets you pick out, just understand that carpet is going to get consumed. So 
you know, you want to find a balance between the most durable carpet and, you know, the 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 least expensive that's still durable a durable product and when you're thinking of colors think about a color that's going to clean clean uh, pretty effectively you know you don't want to have white carpets or something that you're going to have to replace every time someone moves out so a lot of these kind of speckly brown colors is a perfect kind of uh <clears throat> buy and hold carpet something that really can take a beating cleans up okay you know every time you move out you can just have it cleaned and and it'll survive through a few tenant turnovers that's really the crucial thing to consider yeah i think one of the vital things there is uh we say durable not necessarily cheap you know you don't want to be on the cheap end of some of that stuff because Mm -hmm. you don't want to have your handyman going in there on a bi-monthly basis just to replace a shower head or something yep exactly durability over cost Yep. In my opinion. Oh, yep, exactly. And uh, like we say, remember, we're not living in it. So, you know, you're if you might prefer a different type of backsplash or a better, you know, color of, or quality of carpet or something, just remember you're not living in it. So you just have to do what's cost effective and durable. So that's that's uh, <clears throat> and really the main attraction of buy and hold is this is where all you know all the long term wealth comes from. Because once you start adding properties to your buy and hold portfolio, that's cumulative, right? I mean, if if every property is generating one, two, three, four hundred dollars a month positive net profit cash flow, well, how long until your expenses are met by those profits? And when that happens, you're basically financially free, right? So that's really the goal, and that that money keeps appearing. In your checking account, uh, you know, whether you are there or not, you know, one of the biggest eye opening experiences I had was last summer, I took an RV trip for a week down to the Black Hills, about 10 hours away from where we live up here in Fargo, North Dakota area. And it just so happened while we were on this trip, the rent deposits hit my account. And I remarked to my wife, I was like, wow, this is how I dreamed it was going to be, you know, we're on vacation and money is appearing in, in our accounts and we're having nothing to do with it's it being generated. We have a property manager managing the properties. Um, they have a handyman on call. Uh, people are collecting the, the rents and delivering those to us. And, you know, the, the, the notion of passive income is sort of a myth. It's not 100% passive. Nothing is, right? I mean, we you still have to manage the managers. You still have to deal with the property managers once in a while. Um, but, you know, I, I talk to our property managers, you know, once or twice a month for a few minutes here and there, unless there's something going on. So, you know, I'll take that amount of work over, you know, punching the clock any day. So basically... <laughs> The, to, in my mind, the, the most effective destination for every dollar you put into real estate ultimately should end up in a buy and hold strategy. That's where all the wealth is, is created. That's where the true passive income is generated. And that should be the, at the end of the line for every dollar. It should reside there. <clears throat> There's another couple of reasons for that, too. And we'll get into this in our um, Coach's Corner book recommendation, too. But there's some tax strategies um, that really depend on purchasing and continuing to purchase real estate throughout the years. If you just extract profits all the time and never use that to keep buying, um, you know, you're going to have to pay higher amount of taxes on those profits generated. But if you continue purchasing, you can really extend all the tax benefits you're getting out of those those properties as well. Obviously, we're no tax experts. Just uh, saying that as a general general strat- strategic advice. Um, <clears throat> so that's another crucial benefit of, of owning and continuing to purchase real estate. And that's really why I think buy and hold is the best, the ultimate strategy of all of our exit strategies. Well, we might have a, uh, a surprise fifth strategy, but you'll have to tune in for the next episode. Mm-hmm. So uh, with that, we will move on to the next thing. And, and we haven't said this yet, but uh, I suppose it's been three, four weeks now. Josh has kind of done the real estate thing full time here now. And uh, we're kind of checking in, uh, first check in to see how things are going 
what, uh, what's been working, what's been a challenge. And uh, so, Josh, what's been working and what's been a challenge? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, is, this has been kind of interesting. Basically, what happened was I run a photography studio as well as, you know, do real estate investing. And I was finding that there wasn't enough hours, literally, to get everything done. And we had a bunch of closings in a row and all these things on our plate. And Jack, you're still working a day job, you know, nine to five. So I was kind of tasked with doing a lot of these time sensitive things. And I was, you know, it was tough to get everything done. So I just basically said, you know, we're, let's dedicate, have me dedicate some days of the week to real estate and just do that and see how focused, you know, concentrated efforts, see what kind of results those bring. So it's been really interesting. Uh, what My one thing I would say is I don't know how we did it prior to this because the amount of things that I've been doing, uh, it really has been a full-time job, um, you know, because we're aggressively pursuing more acquisitions. You know, we're handing closings, doing lots of dealing with title companies and, and agents and all these, you know, things having to prepare properties for closings, um, <clears throat> dealing with tenants and, you know, just the million, million things you have to do when you're really building your business. And I don't know how we did that when we were both working full time doing other things. So that's, uh, you know, been kind of an eye opener. Um, also, it's spring, you know, that's really a the busy season in real estate. All the buyers are out. So it's actually really competitive right now, too. So, um, you know, I've been looking at a lot of properties, submitting a lot of offers, doing lots of mailers, putting out banded signs, all all sorts of things. So um, it's been great, actually, uh, you know, just to, to be able to dedicate the time to it. Um, so it, it's a work in progress. I'll say that, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll let you know when something breaks loose here. Well, I think there's a lot to be said for those days of dedication because mm-hmm. it, it everybody thinks they can multitask, but in the end, it's it's far more difficult and distracting and uh, you probably find that you'd be more productive if you set aside that time yeah i totally agree with that i mean you know there's lots of things that we i know we wouldn't have been able to accomplish had i not been dedicated and and working on the strategy you know dedicated for uh, multiple days a week so yeah so it's going it's going really well and and we'll report uh more as things develop here throughout the spring and summer so moving on to the lessons of the week, uh, REI specific. Uh, this week we're going to push everybody towards joining your local real estate investing group. If you don't have a group in your area, make one. There's a meetup.org is a good place to organize something like that. And or join any of the professional networks that are likely in your area. Josh and I are members of master networks in this uh, community. So uh, it's another concept of being around those like-minded individuals and uh, all the tide raises all ships again mm-hmm. and being a part of those groups to uh, you're the sum of, of the most fi- what is it what's the uh, term there Josh you're the <laughs> sum of of the five people you hang out with the most yep exactly so you know you want to be around people that are doing real estate investing, right? Or just successful business people. So we've really made a point of, of anytime we have an opportunity to network with other real estate investors, we'll do it. Um, we'll go have lunch, have coffee. We'll meet up at other people's flips. There's a meetup.com group here in town. We go look at other people's properties. Um, you know, like I said, we don't view them as competition. It's a community. Not everybody can buy everything all at once right so there's plenty of properties out there <clears throat> so we we look at the opportunity to network as a true opportunity so we will definitely take advantage of that every chance we get um, so make that a regular part of your week or month um, join like i said the master networks bni um, all these other different professional networks so if there's a ria RIA, the real, we don't have a RIA club here in our town. <clears throat> so meetup.com kind of took the place of that, which is just fine. You know, as long as real estate investors are getting together, discussing topics, trading stories, networking, uh, you're definitely going to see some results from that. Because uh, you know, there's all kinds of strategies and ways to find leads for properties and um, buyers, sellers, investors, properties, everything else that you're looking to do that, to, that you need to make this a 
this business run. And one of the best ways to generate all those things is face-to-face networking. It really can't be beat, honestly. So I would say get out there and get face-to-face with people as much as you can. And then with that, we go to the court, coach's corner, and with tax season just just behind us, mm-hmm. uh, yes. Josh has a great suggestion. All right. Well, this this book is called Tax Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright, How to Build Massive Wealth by Permanently Lowering Your Taxes. He's one of the Rich Dad Advisors. Robert Kiyosaki wrote the foreword. Um, This is a great book. It covers all kinds of topics, and it's really geared towards investors, entrepreneurs, specifically real estate investors. So if you're a real estate investor who pays taxes, which is all of us, um, you would be well served by reading this book. Um, Just a couple... points basically you know over our lifetime it's estimated that we pay approximately 50 percent of your income in taxes right i mean that hurts right and just between all the different taxes sales tax income tax everything else that you encounter in your life approximately 50 percent of your income is gone so one of the one of the best ways to effectively give yourself a huge raise is by lowering your tax burden. So any opportunity you have to do that, you'd want to take advantage of it. There's all kinds of strategies in here, utilizing depreciation, you know, deductions, everything else. And honestly, the tax code is really written in such a way, and this and Tom Wheelwright points this out, it's written in such a way that it really encourages investment. It favors investors and entrepreneurs. That's well, because that's what the government wants to encourage. So they incentivize that those types of behaviors. They do not incentivize getting a nine to five paycheck and having earned income. Those people get penalized the most. You're paying the highest rate of tax off of earned income. Investors and entrepreneurs uh, have much less of a tax burden. So of course you want to be in in that sector and that part of the quadrant as Robert Kiyosaki, you know, the cash flow quadrant. You need to read that book like we recommended on an earlier podcast. You want to be in the investor or the business owner quadrant. The uh, tax wise, it's a huge advantage. So check out Tax Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright. We'll put the link in the show notes. And as always, you can find us on Facebook or Twitter. Answer it, give us any questions there and we'll do our best to uh, get around to answering. Our handle is at REI Rookies. Also, we'd love a positive review in iTunes, Google Play. Subscribe to the podcast. We love it. And remember, get off the bench and get into the game. We'll see you next time. Fix and flip, right, Josh? (laughs) Is that the one today? (laughs) Don't laugh at me now. (laughs) Welcome to the REI Rookies Podcast. I kind of laugh, huh? Welcome to the R.I. Rookies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, we're going to have to edit this out because I wasn't prepared. <laughs>